Welcome, welcome everybody. Um, as you can you can imagine, this is a typical. Uh, I mean, the normal starting time for most those of you who come to lectures will know the well. It's five past the sort of official hour, and, and uh, I will point out that that clock up there is nearly ten minutes fast. The clock on the days here says five twenty-eight. Uh, my own watch says uh, seventeen thirty-four. So between the three of us, we're just about on starting time. And, um, and, and, and first of all, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for, for coming along. Um, this event is being organized by the Cambridge Global Food Security Interdisciplinary Research Center. Uh, and is also part of the uh, Cambridge Zero Climate Change Festival. And we're going to record this so that it will be, a, a transcript will be available of the, the presentation. Um, not, it's, not being, it's not being broadcast live, but it will be available um, on the website shortly. So um, I don't want to spend too long giving too much of an introduction because we've got an amazing lineup of speakers and it's really them that we want to focus on this, 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 uh, this afternoon. What I would encourage you to do is to set aside any preconceived notions that you may have about the rights and wrongs of various of these subjects that they're going to address you. And think of it as a, a straightforward debate where you come in, listen to the speakers, and then decide at the end, by the end of it, think who has convinced you that the arguments they have advanced uh, make the best case for this transformational change that we have needed uh, and we've seen over the last 50 years or so, uh, 60 years ago, with the, the, the time, with the increase in agricultural productivity, the, the green revolution and all the associated changes in agronomy that have been going on uh, as a result of that around the world. But we're also reaching much further back in time to think about the original domestication of crops, how we've used some of those crops and um, more recently, how we now need to sustain that productivity going forward. So it's all you, the, the questions I hope that, that I hope that our speakers will address to some extent will be a historical perspective, but also thinking, really thinking very much about sustainability for the future. Are the arguments you're presenting really going to hold up to continue to be able to feed 10 billion mouths in a climate which is experiencing ever more extremes. So that's the context for the presentation. Now, if I can, I'm going to try and manage this. This, all, this is all slightly new technology brought in since I last gave my lecture in this theatre, but um, we are recording the presentation um, and we will then record the panel discussion that will take place in about half an hour or so. So what I will try to do is, uh, Stop that share. Uh, go to where are you, Martin? You're there. Look at this. And introduce um, Martin Jones, uh, Professor Martin Jones, fellow of the British Academy, from the uh, from just from across the road, the monstrous carbuncle that was in that was <laughs> that was that was inserted into the uh, the courtyard here. Uh, Martin, thank you. Thank you very much, Howard. I, I also came to lectures in this room 50 years ago. So, uh, but anyway, I'm kicking off this. And I thought in this presentation, which as Howard says is a de debate for the case, I thought of doing the whole thing on this one image that's just disappeared. Oh, there, no, it's still there. And uh, this graph, um, it's in log scales. Don't worry about that. There's one major message I want to get to from this slide. Over on the left-hand side, around 10,000 years ago, is the beginnings of agriculture. And the, and the curve is a curve of population. And you can see from this graph alone that the domestication, the, the style of agriculture has multiplied the carrying capacity of this planet by a factor of a thousand, by a factor of a thousand. That's, that's the significance of agriculture. Now, my esteemed colleagues for whom I have enormous respect will be drawing your attention to small pimples on the right-hand side of this curve. But I want to take you to the source and, and see what we can learn uh, from the domestication crops themselves. And almost immediately, I'm going to do something very bizarre, which is undermine my own case and say that agriculture hasn't all been swinging. And I want to do that in relation to human health. Now, I'm an archaeologist. As you can imagine, there's many ways, many fancy scientific things you can do to get into the health of people. And there's a lot of really good research that's been done. For the simplicity um, in an occasion like this, this graph here just takes a, a, a simple rough measure, which works quite well actually in terms of the other ones, and that's the rough measure of human stature. All of these 
all of these uh, uh, images relate to stature through time. On the left uh, is ancient prehistory. The blue line is uh, agriculture. And well, the key thing I want to draw attention to is it wasn't all good agri um, agriculture. There's after agriculture, there are winners and losers. And some of the losers are doing a lot worse uh, than the hunter-gatherers um, preceding that. I want to move to another um, <clears throat> thing. We don't do enough in archaeology. And in terms of the importance of sustainability, we have a lot of information we don't use enough of how long things lasted. If you're interested in the sustainability, that's quite good. And I've just, just to illustrate the point, I've picked out um, two past cultures to make a point. One's quite well known, the one on the right, uh, the Mycenae, the, the, the well-known uh, Aegean civilization, which had a farming system a bit like our own. Uh, and what I mean by that is it heavily dependent on say, half a dozen crops making up much of the farming system. And as you can see, they lasted a few hundred years and uh, some systems last less. And I've contrasted that with a Japanese uh, society uh, called the Jomon Society, which had a vast range of foods and um, at least 15 domesticated crops. And that lasted for several thousand years. So I think there's th th things we can learn from the past about how different systems are, are more or less sustainable than, uh, than others. Um, this is the second and last graph. It's also about population, but the axes are, are, are different. These are linear axes, and this isn't population, this is population rate. And it's just looking at the last two and a half thousand years. And the, ma the main thing I want to point, you can see the modern uh, steep uh, uh, rise, but the main thing I want to convey about this is it wobbles, has wobbled about a bit in time. Now, if you're a historian, looking at, uh, at one of those wobbles on the right. Typically, historians have a, have a, a view of, of years, decades, or centuries. And within that, the narrative is focused on the most conspicuous predator of humans, which in both of those last wobbles was, was the same bacterium, uh, the plague bacterium. However, if you stand back and show this to a mathematician, a lot of mathematicians will recognize this curve, they'll say, that, yes, we recognize that curve. That is the pathway of an ecosystem that has too few components and they're too heavily interconnected. And it's a very well-known curve. And in fact, this slide and the last slide go together because the, sh the short uh, lasting uh, farming systems are those with a, with a small number of, uh, of components that, that are over-connected and, and uh, and a diverse farming system, archaeology has, shown, has much more sustainability. And indeed, this last two and a half thousand years, the point about the last two and a half thousand years, it's, it is the last two and a half, half thousand years when the global food system has shrunk down uh, to a handful of, of cereals, often one major crop in, 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 in different societies. So my last slide in this, uh, five minute presentation is to refine the case I want to make to you. I don't want to, I don't want to simply say domestication is the main thing to think about in terms of what's going to feed the world. What I want to emphasize is a form of domestication uh, such as occurred at the beginnings of agriculture, which is illustrated by this map, uh, which not only arose in over 13 regions of the world, but as you see, if you look at the, at the baseline of domestication, it involved over 60 species of, uh, of tubers and grains and many varieties within them. And all the time through history, we've, we've, uh, there've been forces shrinking us down to monocultures and, and concentration. And I wanna press the case for domestication of a very diverse food ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. In Anna. Um, that's, a, that's a great thing. I think the, uh, the, the, the clear point Martin's making there is one about the diversity of food stuff that are available. And the other thing I think I would say, Martin, is you didn't quite give enough praise to the ingenuity of mankind. We're now facing the modern ingenuity of mankind to deal with the current crisis we've got. But actually, those original observations that led to domestication were pretty amazing, really, in their time. So there's another point for you to um, uh, perhaps 
Right, okay, let me see if I can now find in Anna's. Let's go to the full screen. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Inanna uh, Hamati and Ataya, who is a uh, principal research associate and principal investigator at CRASH, um, also a member of our steering committee on the Global Food Security Initiative. So uh, without further ado, but let's let's hear how, how has fermentation contributed to these, these advances? Thank you very much, Harrod. Um, hello, everyone. So today I'm going to make the case for fermentation. It's a, it's a bit of a challenge to speak after Martin and, and before my other esteemed colleagues, but I'm going to try and make the best case for fermentation, which is perhaps a very strange candidate. Or otherwise I will just rely on your uh, natural inclination to support the underdog in such competitions. All right, let's start with something very basic. What is fermentation and specifically for what concerns us today, food fermentation? I'm not going to get into the the specifics which are well beyond my area of expertise, but at least we can all agree on a very basic uh, definition of fermentation for the kinds of processes that we're interested in, which is that fermentation is a, is a basic process of decomposition of organic substances, usually carbohydrates, into several other kinds of substances, alcoholic, acidic, etc. And the process is induced by microorganisms like bacteria or yeasts uh, or by enzymes. So I don't know, probably many of you during the pandemic have tried to experience with uh, experiment with different kinds of fermentations. I don't know how many of you were bold enough to try and, and produce wine at home. I have some colleagues who, who produced beer. Uh, that was their way of coping with the pandemic, but probably you, you made some yogurt or even more probably you made sourdough bread. And I suppose that three quarters of you at least are now experts in sourdough bread making. So if you've tried to do this, then you will know that you will have used yeast and you will have let the yeast interact with those basic components, which are basically sugars. So the fructose, the sucrose or the glucose that uh, is present in milk or in grapes or in wheat. What we're doing here, what you did was simply hijack a natural process that is the natural metabolic process of bacteria, you hijacked it and you turned it into a biotechnology. This is what we would call a biotechnology. It says the use of living organisms in order to produce another substance that functions, that serves human needs. All right, so what is the history of fermentation? I would like you to ignore the upper part of this slide and just, and even the middle part, if you want, and just focus on the lower part. So the history of humanity or what we call modern homo sapiens, the modern version of our species is 200,000 years old. Sorry, Martin, I'm going to expand your time frame a bit. And of course we are at this moment uh, living in at the edge of our agricultural paradigm. We are food producing uh, uh, human beings who have very well organized the way that they produce and manage their foods. But before that, we were hunter-gatherers. And most of the fermentation practices that we have been aware of for most of our written history concern the fermentation practices of agriculturalists. But in fact, evidence has repeatedly shown in the past years that fermentation is a very old technique, a very old human biotechnology that we started using well before we domesticated crops. So you have some evidence in, in Europe, uh, in Southwest Asia of hunter gatherers uh, trying to control their food security by preserving the food, uh, the animals or the, the crops that they were gathering. And they preserved them through by taming this process of fermentation. And that enabled them to guarantee their food security regardless of variations in the availability of the, their food sources in the climate uh, etc. And this development, the development of human, uh, this biotechnology continued throughout uh, human history. And today we are witnessing a complete transformation of fermentation that is actually um, redefining the way that we produce food even beyond uh, uh, the agricultural paradigm. And I will come to that later. But if you want to look at the whole movie of the history of human uh, the biotechnological use of fermentation, you can think about it as humans starting from the taming of microorganisms, 
the hijacking we observed, like we observed fire, for example, and we learned how to control it. We also observed natural fermentation. We tasted it like other primates and enjoyed it. And then we understood how to manipulate it. So we went from the taming of microorganisms to today, the domestication of the cells of these microorganisms. And I will come to this a bit later on uh, in a minute, probably, because my time is running out. So why did we do this and what are the benefits of fermentation? Of course, fermentation enables us to avoid the spoilage of food so that it can last longer. Uh, it involves also a process of detoxification. It softens food so it becomes easier to digest. And so all the food that is fermented is much healthier and easier for us to process. It increases the safety of food, although it has some risks, of course, but we have learned also how to become more hygienic about the process. It sometimes increases the nutritional value of food. It improves the flavor and texture. And of course, because we spend less time digesting and processing, it decreases our energy expenditure and operating costs. And for, th for this reason, our involvement historically with fermentation practices has had evolutionary benefits. And some of these are very much related to the fact that Fermentation is actually a low-tech alternative to cooking. So it's a low-tech alternative to cooking with fire for hunter-gatherers and with using all other kinds of energy to process food for agriculturalists. It's also, it also improves our energy balance in, climatic, uh, um, in, in cold climates. It improves thereby our thermoregulatory capacity. And this is very important because our whole survival depends on how much energy we expend versus how much energy we can uh, assimilate. And it is a form of uh, uh, food storage and food preserving that actually serves both of our needs, either because it helps us uh, become more mobile when the situation requires us to move because our environment is in danger, or because it enables us to settle down when the environment is benign because we can then store and accumulate uh, food resources on the long term. And this is why if you go back, oops, if you go back to the history of the use of this uh, particular biotechnology, you will see that it has served us for tens of thousands of years. When we think about human history and, and the history of human biotechnology, we're, we're really very culturally egocentric. We just focus on this uh, period of agriculture that I have called age two here. And this is a very short period, in fact, of about 11,000 years. And today we are, of course, reaching the edge of that productive exploitative paradigm because we have uh, uh, overexploited the resources of the earth. We have a problem with our, our water resources, with the way we manage them. We overconsume uh, earth's resources. And so scientists are trying to find solutions to that. How can we sustain this growing population that Martin spoke about without undermining the very sources of production that sustain us? And today fermentation is being used precisely in a way that decouples our dependence on the land uh, through the domestication of the cell of microorganisms. So you might recognize here something that we all eat probably, which is a hamburger, but this is a hamburger that is produced without slaughtering any animal. It is produced in the lab and it is produced through a, a precision fermentation process that creates something called heme, artif super, uh, artificial heme, which is the texture that, which is the, the product, the molecule that gives meat the texture that we all like and crave, at least those of us who eat meat. And so fermentation has actually accompanied us through all the processes of our uh, cultural evolution. And the reason why, the reason why this is a particularly important um, development for us is that if you go back to the very beginning of our cultural development, if you forget about agriculture as our normal state of being, which is a state that we have managed to develop because we developed uh, within the Holocene, which was a very benign condition for us. If you go back to pre-agrarian humans during the Pleistocene, which was a period of extreme of extreme instability, fermentation enabled us not only to survive, but also to colonize the whole planet, to start from a species that is an Afrotropical species that only thrives in a warm, humid climate and to occupy the whole of the earth. 
And this was possible precisely because we managed to hijack that natural uh, process and, and develop a way to store and manage our food resources against any profound uh, climatic variation or transformation in the sources of uh, or the conditions of our lives. And this is why this uh, particular technology has become also consecrated in our cultural values. And I want to make the case that in fact, we have developed a cultural taste for what makes us secure in terms of our food. And this is why if you think of all the culinary traditions in the world, you will always find fermented foods. And very often they are at the top of the pyramids. They are the delicacies of every world's uh, a culinary um, a culture. They're also associated with with high social and economic value. They are saved, they are invested, they are gifted. In ancient societies, they used to pay uh, labor, uh, laborers, manual workers with beer. So this links food security with financial security. Today, we don't do that anymore, but you do still offer a bottle of wine, for example, when you go um, to visit friends. They are also consecrated in our secular and our religious cultural practices. We celebrate with them. They are very much uh, uh, linked to our cultural identity. They are related also to social prestige, whereby we, we subconsciously understand that this is a very sophisticated kind of technology and a craft. And so we give them a higher value than other forms of foods that we produce. And they're also related to ethical values. So most recently, the value of clean uh, food and clean eating and environmentally friendly. So if we go back to what we are currently experiencing in what is called the Anthropocene. I want you to think about whether fermentation might not be the actual technology that is going to take us beyond the current challenges that Martin was talking about. And you might not be surprised if you think about it this way to learn that actually fermentation is one of the technologies that has become part of the solutions uh, that uh, corporations are developing not only for life on earth, but also for life beyond earth. And so there is a, 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 a precision fermentation alternative proteins component to NASA's space program. And so perhaps in 100 years from now, uh, your children or grandchildren will be listening to maybe another social scientist who will tell them about how fermentation helped us colonize this planet and potentially also another planet. And this will be the way, again, that fermentation will have illustrated how it has supported uh, our cultural and environmental adaptation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, uh, that, that's gotten more food for thought, I think, and on, a, on an amazingly uh, broad scale. So uh, I'd like to just, I oh no, God, I may need a cheer, is it? Uh, um, ah, that's what's happened. That one's gone down. Oops. Come back, help. So share with them. And I think that here, the camera may have gone to shallow here. Got it, all right. And where's that? I don't know, I've lost, I've lost Shelley, where's she gone? You haven't lost me, you just lost the presentation. That's all right. <laughs> I'm still here. I am more than a presentation. There we are, brilliant. Don't let him in charge of technology. They, they warned Lucia, but there we are. Thank you very much. So Shalaja Fennell, brilliant, welcome. Um, you are the, uh, in the in Department of Land Economy, Director of the Center for South Asian Studies, Wonderful, and a fellow of the Food Security Initiative. Thank you very Let's much, Howard. Irrigation. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about irrigation, or is it too much water, too little water? What do we do with water? We can't live without water. We're 90% water. We can't grow food without water. Okay, so um, I don't have a lot of words, but a lot of pictures for us to think. We are in Cambridge uh, a decade ago. Um, a very old irrigation system. Most of us in the UK think we don't do irrigation. We are a temperate zone. We cast seed when the rain falls and things grow. Um, colleagues 
in archaeology, again, um, dug up this excellent system of irrigation for growing grapes. What did the Romans give us? They gave us grapes. And what's really interesting about this is it's in the middle of one of those blips that Martin talked about, between 70 and 120 AD. And we're at the moment working on this major project of restoring the peatlands across the UK. And one of the things that we realize is that the human relationship between water, even in the temperate zone, is actually a very complex one. Alongside that, more recently, there was a brilliant book written about a mystery story about Ely, and that's a little map of the areas around us in Cambridge. There was much more water. In fact, the way to get to Cambridge was by boat. And the important place was Ely, because that's where we had the major presence of ecclesiastical power and Cambridge really wasn't important. So even living in the UK, if you think about what we do with water, water is central in terms of cultivation and a way of life. There are some parts of the world, of course, where water today we think is incredibly scarce and they can't possibly be growing food. What I want to illustrate is the previous slide, lots of water, the Fenlands are all water, you can drain them and you can grow grapes and that happens. Parts of the world today that seem like they are sand dunes are actually a very old system of irrigation that links Iran to classical Greek civilizations. The idea of the underground irrigation system where you don't drain water, but water that drains into underground water systems is then stored and allowed to distribute as you see in that Kanat. The Kanat is the name for the underground water system. And we might be more aware of that's an Iranian system, but it was also in Persepolis. So it linked what we call the Middle East today. And so when people think, oh, you know, there's, there's no point because there's some places that can't grow food. There were incredible areas of growth, and this is today a UNESCO heritage site. So water can be stored by human beings. It's our ingenuity in doing it. Too little water? No, go underneath. Too much water? No, drain it. The third is intricate systems, moving water, much more technological requirements. Um, in terms of terraced rice fields, the previous examples I grow, and I am a cereals person, so wheat grows differently for rice, you need wet feet, rice like their feet wet. And those amazing systems of irrigation of terrace fields are part of human ingenuity in terms of writing agricultural texts. The Nongshu books, the agricultural treatises of the 13th century in China, the work of Francesca Bray here when she was in Needham Institute, Woodcuts that show there terraces and canals. You have a terrace to terrace the water, you create canals, polders and dikes. And even today, we have examples of those which exist in the UNESCO heritage. And there are places like Tianyi Huan where you can see the rice fields of the 13th century. So without managing water, you cannot have food. But where are we today? We're in a very difficult place. That very agriculture that relied on water, the IPCC tells us, is destroying our water system. The crops we grow today are using so much of the water, and as we go towards two degrees, and certainly the shift in global warming from that period over the last 2,000 years, from pre-industrial now, of 3.2 degrees centigrade, has increased the number of dry days incredibly. And that has a very important knock-on effect. We often don't understand why water is crucial for agriculture, because it's water that changes the soil. On that side, Nobel Research Institute's recent blog, which shows how sand can become loam, can become silty clay loam. And we all want silty clay loam, right? Because that's the one that grows the fastest. If water goes into degraded areas, then what you end up is a very low saturation point and it will dribble off very quickly. You can't grow in that. And that's what's happening to the world today. Therefore, too much water, too little water, water in the wrong place. They're all incorrect estimations of the relationship between water and agriculture. Today's work on food security in the IPCC's latest report, section five on drought, is categorically asking us to think about changing the crops we are 
growing. So here's the millets messiah two minute, grow millets, you need far less water. But it's not going to be enough because not only is water becoming less, it's becoming more variable. We're concerned about floods, we're concerned about water in the long, wrong place, and most terrifying, we're concerned about the sea inundating our fields, because once you have salt in your field, you cannot grow. So I know Friday afternoon is not a time for terrifying, but there are examples of success and failure. Up there, the IPCC report to my left on the top, it could be Bangladesh, it could have been Pakistan if it was last month, massive flooding of areas with seawater, which now cannot grow food. And there, irrigation, much more thoughtful irrigation, but learning from human ingenuity, micro irrigation, water along and underneath the soil, brings you get the underground of the Kanat with the idea of water in the right place. So preserve the water if you want the food. Water technologies are absolutely critical if we're going to grow. And some of these can be done on a huge scale. Preserve the places there's biodiversity of water use. Two of them below, global peatlands. Do not destroy peatlands. Peatlands, the moment you cut them, you get huge releases of gas. Conserve the peatlands, that's what our project is trying to do. So I'm gonna talk about that. But even more important, Panatal in South America, massive biodiversity between Bolivia, Brazil in the middle, as important as the Amazonia, maybe not in size, it's the size of England, but in terms of biodiversity. So think about water management, irrigation technologies are the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I always like to uh, uh, remind you all that, um, I'm not sure where all these keep going to. Uh, Lucia, I think I will need your assistance again. The, uh, the things just keep disappearing. Um, remind everybody that um, for every time you pick a kilo of rice off the shelf to take home, you're probably stealing about a ton, one to three tons of water from the country that produced that rice. Anyway, now let's move on to Professor Giles Aldroyd, a fellow of the Royal Society, fellow of the American Academy, and also director of our very new Crop Science Centre, uh, which is a joint partnership between ourselves at the University and at NIAB. Uh, and it's a, a great privilege. And I think, Giles, you're being asked possibly to address an area that you, you probably don't directly work on because your work is rather more tailored towards alternative. Mm -hmm. Well, I can talk about the whole lot. Nutrition. <laughs> I'm sure you'll mention that. So um, I'm going to talk about, I, I don't have the benefit of history of our other esteemed colleagues. I'm going to talk about something that's happened really in the last 50 years, which is the Green Revolution which really has underpinned a massive uh, explosion in our food production. And, and without it, we really could not support the global population on which uh, they're currently dependent on our agricultural systems. So really what we're talking about, plants need a lot of water, but the other thing plants need is nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. So they, uh, they can get carbon very effectively through photosynthesis. That's the uh, uh, capture of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plants are really good at that. Plants are less effective necessarily at getting uh, phosphate and nitrogen uh, from their soil. And in particular, agriculture creates something really unique that doesn't exist in nature. And that's the stripping of primary productivity from the soil every year. That's what farming does. It takes off the production, we eat it, we consume it. If we don't put the nutrients back that the plants have removed from the soil, then you're essentially mining the nutrients out of the soil. So the Green Revolution basically allowed the mass replacement of those nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, in the form of inorganic fertilizers. And it was a revolution not only in chemistry, the, the, the production of nitrogenous fertilizers, but it was also a revolution with regard to the genetics of the plant that allowed the application of those nitrogenous fertilizers and still efficient production. Now, the Green Revolution really tripled our production of our cereal grains. So maize, rice, wheat, the staples of our diet, their production massively expanded because as a result of the Green Revolution. Prior to the Green Revolution, there's a lot of discussion. Who's gonna feed China? Who's gonna feed India? In the end, China fed China and India fed India. And that was principally because of the impact of the Green Revolution. Now, 
You could argue without the green revolution, we might have limited population growth, but I actually don't want to live in a planet where population growth is limited by starvation. I don't think that's really the answer to the population problem. And if we didn't have the green revolution, it's estimated that the natural nitrogen cycle can support about 3 billion people on the planet. So in other words, we've already got somewhere between four and 5 billion people and are fully dependent on uh, the Harbour Bosch fixation of nitrogen. A slightly different way to look at that is where is the nitrogen in your body? Where did it come from? Because we live in a rich world and we're consuming a lot of products from inorganic fertilizer production, about 80% of your nitrogen in your body right now that's sitting in the DNA and proteins, et cetera, actually was chemically fixed by the Harbour Bosch process, fed to plants, incorporated in the plants, and then eaten by yourselves. So you really, you personally, right now in this moment in time, is highly dependent and built from Harbour Bosch nitrogen fixation. But unfortunately, you know, that it, it's not a very efficient system, right? So we pour all these nutrients on their agriculture and we get some into crop plants, but we lose a lot out into the environment. And one of the areas where we lose in particular a process of eutrophication, it washes off into our rivers and streams, but it also escapes into our terrestrial ecosystems. And it's the principal source of pollution that's coming from agriculture. It has profound impacts on terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. And wherever we have this intensive agricultural production, we have images like this, whether it's in the UK or whether it's in Australia or China, whatever, eutrophication in our aquatic systems. But actually here in the UK and particularly, in, for instance, Wickham Fen as an example, it's a little island surrounded by agriculture. Nitrogen gets in there very easily. It's volatile. The ammonia is, is volatile and it just rains ammonia into Wickham Fen and it really reduces the biodiversity. So we really have a problem of supporting biodiversity in this intensely agricultural environments, whether that's terrestrial or, 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 or our aquatic environments. It also escapes another way. There's a denitrification process by which bacteria convert it to reactive forms of nitrogen, nitric and nitrous oxides. They are the principal form of greenhouse gases in agriculture. They are equivalent to the releases of methane that we get from ruminant animals. So the greenhouse gases from agriculture are nitric, nitrous oxides, and methane from ruminant animals. And they're about equal in their contributions to greenhouse gas emissions. So really, it's too much of a good thing, and yet we're totally addicted to it, and you personally are benefiting immensely from it. So how do we get ourselves off this? And it's a difficult thing to do because we stop using organic fertilizers. I, I wish we could all go organic. I really do. But we have to cut the population down very significantly. We've got to do that. And everybody in this room needs to eat very differently if we're going to do that. So my research and the project that I, I lead is really trying to find alternative mechanisms. Actually, plants have solved the problem for us. It's already there in nature. There are many plants that can get these nutrients from alternative sources. So fungi help deliver the plants uh, phosphate from the soil. And there's some very clever bacteria that can actually just take nitrogen from the air. 70% of the air you're breathing right now is nitrogen. It's a form of nitrogen that only bacteria can use but there's bacteria converted into ammonia. That's a reactive form of nitrogen that plants can then incorporate. It's actually what we feed plants in, in, in fertilizers. So a group of plants, peas and beans, do this job really well. They get all of their nitrogen purely from the air through nitrogen fixation through these bacteria. And, and, and they live off essentially nitrogen produced by bacteria. And in addition, can also associate with fungi. So for me, I think the future is really to use these natural processes to replace this chemical application of fertilizers. Cereal crops have the mycorrhizal to the fungal association, but it's very ineffectively used in agriculture. So we're striving to maximize that utilization of the fungal association to deliver water and phosphate to the plant primarily. We're just running field trials this year where we have plants that are hyper-colonized by the fungus. And the big aspiration, the, the hardest thing is to move this capability to fix nitrogen. But I think if we can do this and we can really shift from a chemical production of uh, agriculture into a much more natural microbial production of agriculture, then we really transform the way we grow our, uh, our food and drive a much more sustainable way of food production. Thank you very much, Giles. Very... very compelling arguments there for, for uh, both our reliance historically on uh, 
inorganic fertilizers and opportunities of the future. So now uh, moving on to our final speaker. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Tina Barsby, uh, a, a colleague from and former director of the NIAB along Huntington Road. And uh, Tina, you've, you've got the, uh, the challenge, I think, to, uh, to take us into genetically modified crops. Yes, yes, I do. Um, so genetic modification allows genes, characteristics from any species to be moved to another, giving a new trait. And I guess you know that. In Europe, we've regulated, or the regulations were put in place based on the process by which those genetically modified plants were produced. Not by whether they were safe, not by the, product, the products that they produced, whether they were good or bad, but because of this process. And we therefore, the European Union, has got a bit stuck in this system. So, but, so we have to look globally if we want to understand more about what genetic, genetic modification has done. I always think this is quite interesting. So I, I do accept that we need more diversity of, of crops, but if you look at the, the main staples, so maize, white, rice, wheat, and soybeans, they're only increasing by about 1%, a little bit more than 1% a year. But to double yields by 2050 and to feed this growing population, we will need to double yields and so it needs to be 2.4% a year, and we're not getting that. So plant breeding has been going on for many years. Agronomic practices, Giles mentioned chemical fertilizers. There are various ways that yields can be driven up, but they're not, it's not happening quickly enough to cope with global population growth. Also, as you probably know, the loss of crop protection products is pushing yield and quality down. So farmers are able to use less and less of the chemical, the chemicals that are available. Some, many of the chemicals have been banned and it's very difficult for companies to introduce new chemicals onto the market. Climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, well, you know, we, we know that that adds to the problem, but the good thing is genetic solutions are available and GM is part of that solution. So my presentation has a lot more words on it than the others, and there's a reason for that. So um, we could think about what GM crops can do, and they can increase productivity, they can reduce impact on the environment, they can reduce reliance on pesticides, and they can reduce costs to farmers. But in the UK, we don't see any of those benefits. Um, and so I started to think, well, how can I best illustrate what GM crops do? Luckily for me, research published last week covering this 24 year period between 96 and 2020 confirmed that GM technology is, I think, part of a very major part of the solution to reducing agriculture's environmental footprint and securing global food supplies. So the conclusion was that GM crops have increased food, feed and fiber production by nearly 1 billion tons, whilst helping farmers to reduce the environmental impact associated with their crop protection practices by over 17%. GM crop adoption has also reduced carbon emissions arising from reduced fuel use, equivalent to removing 25.9 million cars from the road, from the roads. I like the fact that he uses that analogy because we can all understand what that means. Increased yields through improved control of pests and, um, and weeds. So most of the uh, GM crops on, a, on an acreage, uh, acreage basis that you see around the world are, are either <clears throat> resistant to a herbicide or they're resistant to insects. GM insect resistance has increased yields by an average of 17% for maize and 14% for cotton. And insect resistant soybeans also 
have this report that they've also increased yields since 2013. So these GM crops, because you can produce more on a smaller footprint, we don't need to use additional land, which you would otherwise have to do. So another point that this report makes is that if crop biotechnology hadn't been available to farmers in 2020, maintaining global production levels that year would have required the planting of an area equivalent to the combined agricultural area of the Philippines and Vietnam. Why he chose those two countries, I don't know, but just a very big, a very big area. And there has been a reduction in agriculture's environmental impact where GM crops have been used. Again, in 2020, um, if an additional 23.6 billion kilograms of carbon dioxide would have been emitted into the atmosphere if the GM crops hadn't been grown on those areas, and that's the equivalent of 15.6 million cars added to the roads. And a, a lot of that's to do with the fact that you're not using, you're not using pesticides uh, and you're not going into the crop as often as you normally would to, to, uh, to treat for herbicides, et cetera, to treat uh, weed production. So the, this, this, the, the thing that I think is most astonishing is that farmers growing GM crops reduced the application of crop protection products by 748.6 million kilograms, equal to 1.5 times China's total annual crop protection product use. So I think the argument's very strong, but also farmers have to make a living wherever they are. And over this period, farmers in developing countries received $5.22 extra income for each dollar they invested. And farmers in developed countries received $3 as extra income. So there's, a, there's an overall benefit to individual farmers and also to the overall, overall farm income. So, I mean, I'm not an economist. I'm originally a plant scientist. I've spent a lot of time in the lab actually doing genetic modification, but I thought that the the real impact were the things that is in this report. And coming back to Giles and the Crop Science Centre, many of the things which uh, are being worked on there will require the use of GM technology to, uh, to deliver, whether it's to farmers in the developing world or the developed world. So I think the arguments for GM technology are very strong. Um, obviously, I could go on about what, what people don't like about it, but I just wanted you to have some of the most up-to-date, positive information about, about the technology. Thank you very much, Tina. Perhaps I could ask the, uh, come and take some seats. And, and whilst we're waiting here, I should, I should, I think, point out, I think it is only fair to so refereeing this debate at this moment, that Tina did seem to be making a bid to steal some of Giles's um, kudos here. And I'm a little bit concerned that um, I hope you'll sit at the opposite end of the table. The other point to, to note, of course, is that in to everybody, we think of um, measuring, quantifying everything by area in terms of the size of Wales or Belgium, but the area of crops cur uh, currently under... GM crops currently under cultivation equates to the Iberian Peninsula, France, Germany, and the UK around the world, if you add up all the, the area around the world. So that, that also adds into some of those, uh, those numbers. Right, so we have about 10 minutes for some questions. Um, and I'm going to mediate because um, we have, because we're going to, rec we're recording this through Zoom, I need to repeat the questions for the, for the uh, Zoom here. So would anyone like to ask any of our outstanding panel specific questions that relate or some integrated questions yeah sure can, can, can you speak up please yeah Okay, so that was so the question was about whether we can whether Giles's research has actually introduced a, additional microorganisms uh, into the soil systems. So 
I've seen agricultural soils that are very significant. Mixing the farmer and soils and diversity in the plant. You have a complex network of fungal hyphae in the soil. The, the, the use of uh, fungicides, the constant plowing, the use of fertilizers in agriculture has meant that we've really depleted those fungal systems. So actually it's about really getting back to the, the, the levels of complexity you see in natural ecosystems and our agricultural ecosystems, such that we can benefit from those nutrient services from these, these microorganisms. They are already present in our soils, in, in our agricultural soils, and it's a matter of just really accessing them and amplifying them through better use in our croplands. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can we can we can we move on? Because we we are very short of time. There is an opportunity to talk to the panel at the end. So brilliant. So would anyone like to direct a question to another member of the panel? Um, my question is, uh, how would you sort of reply to people who say that this three phase of the entire agricultural system and have much more high tech commercial farming at the point of high soils? Okay, can I, can I pass that to Tina? So the, the question there was, how can we introduce uh, aquaponics, hydroponics, vertical farming, high technology, and will that solve the problem of feeding 10 million people, well, 10 billion I'm, people? I'm a bit skeptical about vertical farming because of the energy required to feed the vertical farming system. Um, you know, I, and, and also the sorts of things that you can currently grow in vertical farms, they're, they're really like leafy salads and microgreens, they're very, very limited, uh, but there's been a huge amount of investment in the technology. So I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's a combination of using these um, new processes, so robotics, et cetera, in a farming system, as well as what we're now calling regener developing regenerative farming systems, which those of us who did agriculture a few years ago, it's just the way we used to farm, um, but bringing it back so that you have a soil that is that is rich in microorganisms and has the capability to, to do some of the things that Giles was talking about. Okay, Bryn, can we have another question for another speaker? Another speaker. Um, what is your take or your prediction on the, regulation, um, on the regulation of genetically modified organisms and how that specific fermentation Okay, well, Inanna, do you want to tackle that in terms of precision fermentation and acceptability? In the UK specifically, I, I think it's very difficult to know now because we're not sure which regulations we're following or we might want to follow, but there, at a global level, um, as was the case with everything else, including also for GMOs and all this, there are many different kinds, there are many different perspectives that are clashing, they're antagonistic. There's also a public perception of things that are um, national interest in preserving organic kinds of productions and terroir and all this. The European Union has invested a lot in protecting, you know, what counts as uh, Camembert and what counts as Champagne and all this. Um, China and the US, on the, on, on the other hand, are very much, you know, against these kinds of rigid and normative frameworks. So I think that a lot of it is going to require um, a change of perspective, more flexibility, um, and certainly the, the, the system can no longer be just a uniform system where one solution fits everyone everywhere and we operate only on one plan. It has to be something that is very flexible, that is local, that involves indigenous knowledge as well as high-tech biotechnology and trying to understand that we need to intervene at very different levels. And the legal framework has to help us do that, but it's going to be difficult because the labels are important and the interests and the economic interests are very important. But I think that one of the major things that we can do is try to make this as public and as open access kind of knowledge as possible. And this should break down the barriers towards the monopolization of particular technologies and putting them back in, in the hands of the people who actually uh, can deploy them. So whether it's you know, uh, the, the, the intellectual property related to particular genetic, you know, to crops or the intellectual property related to all these technologies that are happening behind closed doors now. It's not even in the university, it's startup companies. You're aware well of that. Uh, the, all the technology about, you know, lab grown meat, etc. <laughs> it's happening in corporations. It's not happening at the university. It, it's, you know, there isn't a degree actually to 
Okay. Brilliant, thank you. And I've got a solution as well. Can I just chip in as ch chair's prerogative? I think we should declare everything that's got GM components in it, GM, okay? So the chicken you buy uh, has got soy, come from Brazil, it's got, it's GM. The fizzy drinks you buy have got corn syrup, which comes from maize, that's all GM. Label it all GM, okay? Now we'll have a price differential between those, there'll be three. And if you can afford organic and you want organic, go and buy it. If you want conventional farming, you can buy it. But if you're feeling the pinch in your pocket, then maybe you'll consider the cheaper alternative. As, because as Tina said, the inputs and the savings for farmers are considerable when the technology is embraced. Sorry, um, anyway, are we, do we have time for one more question? Sure. Okay, so the, the question was about whether there are possibilities for perennial crops that rather than annual crops, as which would be more sustainable for the future. I think I have a really interesting idea. And I think the key thing there is to look amongst the broader canvas of crops, the ones that already are perennial, like a number of, 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 of tropical perennial tubers and so forth. I think one of the interesting things about, I'm very, if I can connect with Giles' fascinating paper, one of the interesting things that one of the interesting things about how these developments happen is, is for understandable economic reasons. As soon as there's a new development, the first thing is how can we do that for wheat, rice, or maize? Because there's a massive investment of capital. The great advantage we have now, even as little as 30 years ago, that was a necessity because the cost of understanding a new crop was enormous. Uh, if, if, we, if, we, if we now find, as you suggest, quite an unusual perennial um, uh, uh, staple like that, even if nothing is known about it, the cost of building up scientific knowledge of it has dropped phenomenally in the last 30 years. So I think it's a great idea and it's much more possible now and it's much more possible to go out to the diversity and start, we're not stuck with just having to look at wheat, rice and maize all the time. Thank you. And if you could just let Sharjah wishes to come in as well and give her a chance to also Thank you. remind you of her uh, interests. No, I'm just uh, like to go back and say, uh, looking at perennial crops, um, and I think uh, Martin started it off very nicely. Let's not look at rice, wheat, and maize. Let's look at all the other crops that are called the forgotten crops. And that's the point I was making about human ingenuity. We have a huge variety, whether we're looking at Svalbard and Crop Trust, we have 27 seed books that we now think can work with each other. If you look at that huge biodiversity, then the need to talk about managing water, managing resources, managing yields becomes a very different conversation. And within that perennial crops, and the whole point about managing water is we need to conserve the water going forward. So if you think about sphagnum moss, you think about any of these, there are much more effective natural solutions that we can think about, which doesn't mean that we don't have modern technologies. Tina's point is absolutely correct. There is space for both of these, but we need as many solutions going forward. Thank you very much. Right, so we're now going to finish on a, on a little bit of fun, which I hope. Uh, and this is now, as I said to those of you at the start, we want you, you to now have a, a, a quick vote on, the, on running down the speakers in order of presentation as to who you think has made the most compelling argument this evening, irrespective of what you thought before you came into this room, regarding the importance of their, the technological advances they've been describing. So we start off at the top, of the, the top of this with Martin Jones, who, if you remember, told us about the crop domestication and um, how important that has been for the whole development of civilization and how potentially it could be important for the future. So how many would vote for Martin as major contributor this evening? Okay. Okay, right, well, we have, we have uh, somebody will have to keep a count of this. We've got eight for Martin. All right, so next on the list, we had um, Inanna, who, who uh, made a very compelling story for the, the past importance of fermentation and the future relevance in terms of alternative products. So who would like to vote for Inanna? 
There you are. There's some of you who are clearly keen to partake of fermented um, products very shortly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think that's another seven or eight. Right, excellent. And following that, we had um, Shalajer, who emphasized the importance of water. I mean, let's face it, you can't grow plants without water. And she has shown the importance of irrigation systems. And it's really vital in many areas of Asia that we, uh, we alter the types of irrigation that is so that we, that in, in itself becomes much more sustainable. And in the United States as well, where serious depletion of groundwater is occurring. So who'd like to vote for Shalajah and water? Right, one, two, three, four, five. I make 16, but I could be making it up. <laughs> um, okay, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, now, and then we heard from Giles. Now Giles gave a very ex excellent account of the historical importance of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer, but also hinted at the, about the, 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 the agronomic costs that have come with that, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the need for plants to harvest those nutrients more sustainably for the future. So how many think that that is the most important thing to feed us all for the future? <laughs> I might have a tie, but then again, there we are. Okay, and then finally, and finally, and perhaps this is um, this the, again. Um, the final area we heard was was Tina making a very compelling case for the uh, sustainability savings in terms of those inputs that could be brought to agronomic systems if we were to adopt. Um, GM technologies, and by that I mean also not just the traditional GM, but also the more advanced gene editing techniques, which tend to leave less of a mark in the genome than perhaps genetic, the, the, the earlier genetic modification. So how many of you think that is going to be the future to feed the world? Fourteen. Fourteen. How many? I've got fourteen. What did you get? What did you get? Oh, I got 14. That's all right. I got 14. Well, you've got... I've got a tie with Shalajah and Giles. No, 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 no. So. Okay, so um, there's a the, the, the this is the trouble with the trouble with having these votes. You know, it, it can lead to terrible problems around the around the country when you have very narrow margins. Um, <laughs> Or, or you get a tiny minority only voting for one individual. Anyway, um, <laughs> however, however long she may last. Um, okay, so um, I, I got a tie between Shalajah and Giles, but my, my more, more authoritative teller here, <laughs> Abigail, made Shalajah the winner. So congratulations, Shalajah. Thank you very much. And... and and Martin was very insistent that there should be a gift. So I'm sorry, Martin, but <laughs> shall we? Congratulations. Okay. For the, for the, I, mean, I think we're just about, well, we're on time according to this clock. We may be a little bit over. Um, for those of you who'd like to come and talk to the speakers, if they're able to stay, we do have some uh, drinks and nibbles available in the library. And, and I think even, for the, I, I guess, provided that we're not completely swamped, we can accommodate some of our outside guests as well. If you'd like to come and speak in person to some of our presenters for uh, 20 minutes or so. Thank you very much, everybody. Please join us.